Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich freue mich, Sie heute Abend begrüßen zu dürfen zu einer weiteren Lagebesprechung. Das ist eine Reihe, die ich mit Clemens Pornschlegel zusammen von der LMU hier gestalte. Und Clemens Pornschlegel kann leider heute Abend nicht dabei sein. Ich freue mich aber, Sie, äh, Ihnen heute zwei Gäste vorstellen zu dürfen, äh, nämlich Graham Harmon, dessen objektorientierte Ontologie heute im Zentrum des Abends stehen wird. Und dann wird, anschließend wird es eine Diskussion geben äh, zwischen Graham Harmon und Slava Zizek, die ich, zum, die ich moderiere. Und ich hoffe, dass wir dann auch äh, im, in ein Gespräch geraten mit, den, mit Ihnen äh, in Bezug auf die Fragen, die sich, die sich dann ergeben. Äh, das ist ungefähr der Ablauf des Abends. Der, die Struktur sieht so aus, Graham Harmon wird ungefähr einen Vortrag von 45 Minuten, 40, 45 Minuten halten, damit wir irgendwie einen Begriff bekommen, worum geht es in objektorientierter Ontologie. Und dann, glaube ich, werden wir eben ungefähr eine weitere Dreiviertelstunde diskutieren, sodass wir so gegen 20.30 Uhr dann die Veranstaltung beenden. Ich lege da immer ein bisschen Wert drauf, dass die pünktlich oder nicht allzu lange dann sich darüber hinauszieht, weil gerade linksintellektuelle Veranstaltungen in einen unendlichen Diskurs geraten. Und dann ist es gut, dass man einen autoritären Schnitt macht. Und das habe ich mir angewöhnt und damit habe ich eigentlich ganz gute Erfahrungen gemacht. Okay. Ich werde jetzt ein bisschen ins Englische kurz switchen, um Ihnen nochmal Graham Harmon vorzustellen. Eben ist angereist aus den Vereinigten Staaten. Graham Harmon ist Professor of Philosophy at the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles. He has also lectured at the American University in Cairo and the European Graduate School in Switzerland. Harmon obtained his PhD at DePaul University on Heidegger, which laid the ground of his so-called object-oriented ontology. And he is considered one of the leading proponents of a school that's called Speculative Realism, and has especially in the last three years presented his Heideggerian and Husserl-inspired ontology in several outstanding books. One book is Object-Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything, and another book with the title The Rise of Realism, uh, and a third book, Speculative Realism, an Introduction. So Graham Harmon, again, thanks for coming all the way, and uh, we are looking forward to understand what's object-oriented ontology is all about. Thanks. Great, and thank you very much, Dominic, for this opportunity. And I'm pleased to have with me here for the third year in a row, Slavoj Žižek. We were together in Cincinnati in 2016, but he had to leave early. And so he kindly offered to come to Los Angeles to my new institution, the Southern California Institute of Architecture. We had a nice conversation on stage, and now we have this for the third straight calendar year, 2018, an object-oriented ontologist and someone I would call a subject-oriented ontologist. Uh, so we are polar opposites and perhaps enemies in some respect, although I've been a fan of his book for, books for years. And as I mentioned last night, I'm going to deliberately embarrass Slavoj Žižek uh, here. Since the passing of Jacques Derrida in 2004, Slavoj has been the person able to draw the largest crowd. So I'll give him the credit for this. He's filled up the Sydney Opera House and other large venues. I would also call him one of the three philosophers in Western history who could have earned a living in stand-up comedy if necessary. And I've, <laughs> what? Three? Yeah, the other two. I'm going to tell you. The first, Diogenes the Cynic, man full of one-liners. The second, Giordano Bruno, burned at the stake. And the third, perhaps at some point to be burned at the stake. Slavoj Žižek. Maybe I shouldn't joke about that, the way the world is going. So, subject-oriented ontologist and an object-oriented ontologist. Object-oriented ontology. First of all, you need to forget all of the connotations usually associated with the word object. Something hard, physical, solid, inhuman. Uh, object, an object-oriented ontology is a, meant to be a universal term, the way it was in the Austrian tradition of, of Meinong. Uh, an object is anything for me that cannot be reduced downward or upward. It is something uh, integral in itself that cannot be exhausted either by explaining what it's made of or what it does. And I want to lay stress on that point. Some of this will be repeated from last night. So if some of you were here uh, across the street last night, some of this will be repeated a bit. But uh, there are really only two kinds of human knowledge. If somebody asks you what something is, there are really only two kinds of answers. And I've thought about this long and hard. I can't think of any others. If someone asks you what something is, you can tell them what it's made of, or you can tell them what it does. 
and that's fine. The human species requires knowledge to survive. We would all die violent deaths if not for knowledge in medicine and engineering and other areas. I'm going to argue, however, that philosophy is not a form of knowledge. And that's not especially original because Socrates said the same thing. We've forgotten this. We've had a kind of physics and mathematics envy since the 17th century in philosophy. We've been trying to build philosophy out of unshakable first truths and deduce philosophical truths axiomatically and, and so forth. And so is even part of the tradition, not as, not as extreme as Badiou and Mayasu, his students. But he's, he's on the rationalist side of this, I would say, more or less. And we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, the first type of knowledge involves what I call undermining. If somebody asks you what something is, you tell them what it's made of, and you try to find a, a small enough thing that it's made of that you can explain it. So uh, look at the pre-Socratics, the dawn of Western physics. Some say the dawn of Western philosophy. I would say Socrates was the first philosopher, but that's another uh, debate. What do the pre-Socratics tell you? They tell you either that there's some ultimate physical element of which everything is made, such as everything's made of water, Thales, everything's made of air, Anaximenes, everything's made of atoms, Democritus and Leucippus, or everything's made of air, earth, fire, and water, joined by love and separated by hate. Um, uh, then there's this more radical group of pre-Socratics who say that even all of those answers are too specific. You need something more vague in general, and you've got what they call the aperon, this kind of boundless, formless lump into, from which everything emerges and into which everything passes again in turn in the future. So the problem with this kind of philosophy is that it does not account for what we call emergence. I just did an event with my fellow realist Manuel Delanda in Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago, and he's very strong on this point. He gave the example of uh, human reputation as an emergent property. No individual person in isolation has a reputation. When you get a society of a large enough uh, size, you're going to start talking about people who break their promises or don't do their share of the work and so forth. But you need a certain number of people for this to happen. Or you need a certain number of people for an authoritarian state to emerge and so forth. So the underminers cannot really account for something that emerges over and above its parts. The classic example, water. Uh, you might know through quantum chemistry that hydrogen and oxygen combined in the right proportion will have certain properties, but whether or not you can predict it is not the point. The point is that water itself has certain properties that are not found in either hydrogen or oxygen until they are combined in just the right proportion. So undermining fails to account for emergence. These days we usually see the uh, undermining attitude on the side of the natural sciences, in particular physics. Delanda, for example, uh, is much more positive towards chemists. He's written a nice book on philosophical chemistry because he thinks of the physicists as wild reductionists and he doesn't want anything to do with them. So the chemists for him are the paradigm of, of good natural scientists. However, the modern move is the opposite one. If the first one is called undermining, I had to coin a term, and you could, you could only do this in a few languages. Uh, the term I came up with was overmining. It's a word that exists in English, but it means something else. It means to exhaust the minerals in a mine by taking too many of them out. What I mean by overmining is the opposite of undermining. That instead of saying objects are too shallow and you have to go down and find the particles that are real, it's the opposite. It says that this idea of real objects is too deep. All there really are are events or language or power or relations. Um, and the idea of individual autonomous things is somehow oppressive or, or hierarchical. And we should simply talk about the surface and what happens uh, when things interact. And one of the great philosophical overminers is one of my favorite living thinkers, Bruno Latour, who is much bigger in the social sciences, of course, than he is in philosophy. For him, everything is real insofar as it acts. Everything is equally an actor. Some actors are stronger than others. Uh, this table is a stronger actor than some comic book character in some sense, because the comic book character we can forget about when we sleep. We always have to take account of this table, because I will trip over it if I walk into it without taking account of it, and so forth. Now, what's the problem with overmining? And here's where Slavoj and I start to disagree a bit more, because I would consider him an overminer as well, insofar as uh, he's not a realist in the way that I am or that Delanda is. For him, the subject uh, is still central, whereas the object is central for me. And I've given an argument for this that, that he doesn't like, but I th ironically, he ends up relying on it himself. And that argument is that if you overmine the world, you can't really explain change. Because if a thing is nothing more than what it's currently doing, if a thing is nothing more than its actions, you can't explain the fact that it's engaged in other actions in the future, five minutes from now or a year from now. And at one point, Slavoj called this a stupid argument. But actually, there are two reasons it's not stupid. One of them is that Aristotle came up with this argument. And Aristotle may be wrong sometimes, but he's never stupid. Aristotle in the metaphysics is engaged in argument with a very prominent group of opponents at the time, the Megarians, from Megara near, near Athens. 
The Megarians are the ones, they're kind of early versions of Bruno Latour. They said, you're only a house builder if you're building a house right now. If you're not building a house, you're not a house builder. And this is what led Aristotle in a counter movement to coin his famous concept of potentiality. Because obviously, there's a sense in which I'm not building a house right now, and a master house builder sitting here is also not building a house. We have actually architects here in the audience. They're maybe master house builders, they're not building. But obviously there's a difference in status between me and them. They are able to build a house anytime they want to get to work, I am not. I don't know the basics. And so you could say in a certain sense, these architect friends of mine who are here are potential house builders in a way that I'm not, even though neither of us is building. Now, what I'm looking for here is a kind of surplus in the thing. A thing is not just what it's doing right now. A thing has something in reserve that it's not enacting, that it might under different conditions. And it turns out that Slavoj has something like this as well. He, in his uh, the recent co-authored book, Reading Marx, which was published early in 2018, it's with Slavoj Žižek, uh, Frank Ruda, and Egon Hamza. Uh, and each of them writes one chapter. Slavoj's chapter is the first, and he talks about object-oriented ontology in some detail there, and his disagreements with it. And he says there that there is a surplus, but it comes from the side of the subject. So it's not that the, uh, the table itself has potentials uh, that are surplus beneath its current actions, but that the, somehow the subject provides these. And for me, this is a textbook case of overmining because you can't really get any kind of change unless the, there's something in the things that is a surplus that is able to act differently than it is now. Okay, so those are the two basic terms, undermining, overmining, two kinds of knowledge, I respect them. We can't live without them. And sometimes they are very necessary. For example, uh, you can undermine morning star and evening star, as analytic philosophers do, and point out that they're both Venus. There's one thing that actually explains both of those phenomena. You can also do it the other way and say that overmining is necessary. You can say there, there is no such thing as a witch, right? The, the, the witch trials in the United States in the 1600s. There is no witch. There are just all these various random incidents like dead cats on the doorstep and the sound of cackling at night and uh, somebody makes an apple pie. How did they get the apples inside the crust? Um, all of these phenomena are independent and there isn't really a unifying underlying thing called a witch. So you overmine it and say it's just a number of symptoms. Or somebody thinks they have cancer and it turns out they don't. They're a hypochondriac and they have all these symptoms that are randomly interrelated. They don't really have any underlying cause that's the same. So those are needed. However, you cannot account for reality simply through knowledge. There are certain kinds of human cognition, aesthetics being the primary one, where you cannot get at the reality of the thing by undermining or overmining it. I should first say that there's a combined form. The combined form is the usual form, where the two are parasitical off of each other. Each bolters, bolsters the weakness of each other. And the term I came up with for this, the first one that came into mind was duo mining, D-U-O mining. And as I mentioned last night, I don't like to coin neologisms. I like to use words that are already out there and bend them slightly. And so I immediately Googled the phrase duo mining to see if anyone had, had come up with it. And to my great pleasure, someone has been using it, and that someone is the credit card industry, uh, where duo mining means text mining and data mining somebody simultaneously to find out as much information about them as we can. It's got the nice sinister connotation. And uh, the most famous example is that credit card companies can predict your divorce three years in advance with 70% accuracy before you even suspect it. I don't know exactly how it works, but it's something they're able to read changing purchase patterns in a way that bodes ill for your marriage uh, with 70% accuracy three years in advance. So uh, we're looking for mo a mode of human cognition or modes of human cognition that are able to avoid duo mining. And again, the French translator had a heck of a time with this. He had to switch to construction metaphors because you can't really do that in French with these prefixes and other languages. Okay, art. What is so special about aesthetics for object-oriented ontology? Where if, for my friend Quentin Mayassou, just as for his teacher Alain Badiou, mathematics is the privileged discourse. Mayassou thinks that uh, mathematics is what gives us the primary qualities of things. Through mathematical formalization, you can find out what a thing really is. For me, it's aesthetics. What is so important about aesthetics? Well, aesthetics alludes, it hints, it points at realities without being able to paraphrase them, as liter literary critics would say. Uh, you paraphrase a thing when you can replace the name of that thing by a list of attributes that explain what it is. And this is what you do in the sciences. If you're assigned to work on an electron, to work on the problem of electrons and what they are, you are supposed to take this proper name electron and replace it through experiments and theoretical manipulations with a set of qualities that actually belong to electrons. This is not what you do in arts, obviously. You do not undermine or overmine in the arts. You're trying to find the, a distance between an object and its qualities. 
so uh, you, see, you have a painting or a sculpture, for example. It's not a good piece of art criticism to explain the physical materials of which the artwork is made. So you've got Picasso's Guernica. You're not going to say, uh, my interpretation of this piece is that's made of canvas and oil mixed in a certain proportion. Yes, this is a helpful piece of basic information in, in art criticism, but it's not going to give you what the artwork is. You're not going to find out about Guernica from knowing the physical constitution of it, unless in some really contrived Dadaist scenario where somebody is deliberately just putting materials out in front of you and thinking that suffices for art. But you're also not going to overmine the arts. You're not going to say that Picasso's Guernica is simply equivalent to the socio-political effect that it has, uh, which some people think is what art should be that art is a series of meanings and social commentaries. No, it's deeper than that, but it's also more shallow than the, than the physical particles in a way. It's, it's emergent beyond the particles. It's also submergent, I would say, beneath the social relations and meanings. Art is just one example of that. It turns out that philosophy has been this way since Socrates. What is Socrates most famous for? It's, of course, fa he's famous for saying he knows nothing. He's never been anyone's teacher. You can't find a single passage in any Platonic dialogue where Socrates answers any question adequately. He never gives us an adequate definition of friendship or justice or love or virtue or any of these other things he's asked about. He, he is able to undermine various definitions that are offered of these things, and he's able to get closer and closer, perhaps, without getting at the thing itself. And this is what philosophia means, etymologically. It means a love of wisdom, and we've forgotten that in the last four centuries because we have been so saturated with, with physics and geometry envy that we've wanted to create philosophy as an exact science, as a rigorous science, as a kind of mathematical formalization. And um, we see this especially in the type of philosophy that I would call neo-modernism. And I usually hate it when people call others neo something or other, because this means it's a kind of um, belittling phrase where you can imply that we've already seen something before, nothing new is added by these neo-whatevers. So sometimes you hear a Hegelian call Heidegger a neo-Kantian, as though he's simply stuck with something in itself out there that we can't get at. And this uh, substitutes for an actual argument against Heidegger. You can call it, he's just a neo-Kantian. We Hegelians know what this is all about. He adds nothing. I am, however, going to use the phrase neo-modern for Slavoj Badiou and Mea Su, whether he likes it or not. I want to provoke a little quarrel here tonight, but it could be an interesting one. Uh, and I want to contrast that with what I would call the non-modern position, which is a term coined by Bernard Latour. Uh, somebody I have a lot of disagreements with, but also some fundamental agreements. Bernard Latour, of, co of course, wrote the book, We Have Never Been Modern, and I think he got at least one thing right about modernity in that book. If you haven't read it, you should. It's a short work. You can read it in one or two sittings. What is most modern in philosophy is a kind of taxonomy in which there are two kinds of things, subjects and objects, or, as I would say, humans over here and everything else over here. So here you've got humans. And here you've got quasars, black holes, dragons, fairies, uh, tables, fictional characters. Everything else in the universe goes into the other basket. And we poor, sad, doomed species over here take up 50% of ontology. And this is probably the most fundamental disagreement I have with these other very important thinkers I've just called neo-moderns in quotation marks. Because I don't think philosophy should start with that taxonomy. Philosophy, for me, uh, starts with the form of a flat ontology, where everything is equally an object. Now, of course, I realize that humans have some special features that are not found in many objects. We're able to, we have a history. We have uh, repression in a psychoanalytic sense. There's language, although I think language is more easier to find in, in animals than it, these other things are. Uh, we, as humans, are naturally concerned with human beings in a way that we're not concerned with, with other things. So there's a, an, a sense in which humans are a very important topic for us, but this does not mean that we deserve 50% of ontology. And specifically, you could say this. There are two ways that one could try to get past Immanuel Kant. We're all still in Kant's shadow in some sense. And you asked me a question today. Do I think Heidegger escapes Kant's transcendental standpoint? No. And this is why I think ultimately Heidegger is not as important as Kant, because Heidegger takes for granted this horizon that Kant establishes. Uh, and so. For me, Kant is still the big figure looming behind us, casting a long shadow. We're all still working within it. Now, there are two different things going on in Kant. What, the, the side that the German idealists reversed, and that contemporary figures such as Slavoj and Meissu uh, reverse, and Badiou maybe less explicitly, but it's still there, is this idea that the thing in itself is in some sense contradictory. 
right? Because if you're trying to think a thing outside thoughts, that itself is a thought, and therefore you can't really get outside this circle and we're, we're, we're working within it. Measu, for all his critique of correlationism, explicitly says uh, there is a conflict, an aporia, between what he calls the correlational circle, the fact that we can't think a thing outside thought without thinking it, and the results of natural science, ancestrality and the argue fossil, as he calls it. He, that's the aporia with which he starts. He doesn't just start by saying science is right, therefore realism is true. He says science seems to be right, and yet this anti-Kantian argument of the German idealist is also right. You have to do justice to both. And that's why he goes on this very strange detour to come up with a proof for uh, his own brand of speculative materialism, which I've argued in my book about him does not work. But the, it's still very quite ingenious. Okay, so that's one way of, of uh, trying to get past Kant, is to say that he was a great genius except for this contradiction about the thing in itself. And it's interesting to note that even though everyone who's been a philosopher since Kant, although some have been very critical of Kant, uh, everyone respects him on some level, right? Kant is the, the grandfather of us all in contemporary philosophy. But almost nobody embraces his central idea, which was, in fact, the thing in itself. The thing in itself is what prevents dogmatism in the old sense of metaphysics. Uh, that was, in a sense, Kant's showpiece uh, concept, and yet almost nobody follows it. You can count on one, maybe two hands, the number of philosophers who have accepted it since then. Uh, mostly everyone admits that it was a bad idea. Now that's one way you can get beyond Kant, but there's another thing going on in Kant that you could reverse instead. Instead of German idealism, we could have had what I propose to call German realism, which never happened. Although object-oriented ontology is trying to do it a couple of centuries later, which is where you could have said, the problem with Kant is not this thing in itself. The thing in itself is what's great about Kant. The problem is that he restricts it to we poor humans with our finitude can't get at the thing in itself. As though only humans had an outside. Realism is sometimes defined as, as the notion that there is a world outside the mind. Why is that part outside the mind added? Doesn't anything else have an outside? Is it really just our mind that has an outside? Uh, Object-oriented ontology expands this to say every interaction has an outside. When you have two inanimate objects engaged in a relation, that too is an act of translation, just as a human encounter with the world is. And so you could say that whereas uh, post-Kantian philosophy tends to view the subject-object relation as central, triple O, object-oriented ontology, sees the subject-object relation as just a special case of the object-object relation. We can talk about object-object relations just as we talk about subject-object relations for the simple reason that I don't have direct access to my own relation to the world either. You know, Dick, why did Descartes think the subject-object relation was something special? It's because he thought we had superior certainty about this relation, that we had an immediate access to it so that it had to be true. I, I must think. Even if everything else is an illusion, I am here thinking. Whereas for him, objects, that we had immediated knowledge of objects based on the goodness of God that enabled us to be confident that we're not being deceived by this all-powerful evil deceiver. Whereas for Triple O, yes, humans are very interesting and intricate, more than many other objects are, and yet object-object relations are the starting point for philosophy. There's no special status for the subject-object relation. And I have said uh, last night and elsewhere that one of the symptoms of the modernist privileging of the subject-object relation is the fact that we don't really have good philosophies of animals in the modern period. Not that we had them before, but who is the best philosopher of animals? Uh, there, there's a pretty bad track record. You know, Descartes can only treat animals as machines. You can torture a monkey with a knife, and if it screams, who cares? It's just a machine. It's not the cogito. Uh, it's just objects, right? With, they don't sense anything. Um, Heidegger, and you brought this up today, earlier, the 1929-30 course. Um, and what's, what's the title of it? I, it's been so long since I read it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, where he, he has got a very good analysis of boredom in that lecture course. But the analysis of animals, it has a lot of interesting case studies, but he doesn't really do anything with it. He says, Weltarmut, this world poverty. Uh, stone, stone is weltlos, if it's worldless. Humans are world forming, weltbildend. And the animal is weltarm, it's poor in worlds. Now, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that he never really explains how you can be poor in worlds. You raised another question, which is, how do we know something's poor? Is it simply by comparison with the human access to the world, or do we, can we see in itself that it's poor in some way? There's another problem, which is, are you going to say that bacteria are world poor and dolphins are world poor and gorillas are world poor? There seems to be quite a bit of difference, quite a range in there of different kinds of animals. But the idea that the human cognition is something so special doesn't really allow you to differentiate between dolphins and bacteria. Um, 
let alone plants. And plant philosophy is becoming more popular. I see there have been several books on this in recent years. Michael Martyr and Emmanuel, Emmanuel Coccia, is that his name, in France. So that's, that's starting to happen. I think eventually the symptom that we're moving beyond modern philosophy will be that you'll start to see really good books about animals, the philosophy of animals. And that's one symptom to keep an eye on. All right, so uh, object-object relations, nothing special about subject-object relations. And then, yes, of course, we have to come up with a new way to talk about what is interesting about human cognition, what is special about human cognition, but not one that starts off by assuming you have humans here and everything else over here. Now, what usually happens, people will usually produce alibis to say that they're not really talking about humans when they talk about the subject. Slavoj does this in the Reading Marx chapter, where he says that in some sense the subject is inhuman, that it's not really human. There's something terrifying about it. Um, in the case of Badiou, you have this idea that the subject is not a human individual, the way it is for Descartes, that not everyone is a subject, and that some human collectives can be subjects if they act in a certain way. Um, there's another one. Oh, Heideggerians will always get get me with this, even though I started my career writing books on Heidegger, or writing a book on Heidegger, that they'll say, well, Dasein isn't really human, right? Because this is Heidegger critiques humanism, and therefore Dasein isn't really human. Okay, well, name any other entity that can be Dasein for Heidegger. There is none. Um, Husserl tries to play the game of saying the thinking creatures of other worlds could also be thinking subjects. Okay, but what are these thinking creatures of other worlds? We've not encountered any of these yet. So um, there's an attempt to shield oneself from the consequences of this human-centered subject-object relation by saying, well, it's not really human. Another thing that happens is that people try to get out of the subject-object dyad by simply making it symmetrical. And so an example of this would be Merleau-Ponty. And I call Merleau-Ponty, I've got a category called philosophers of the future. And these are philosophers who everyone's always saying, oh, if we can get to where that philosopher is, we haven't caught up with that philosopher yet. If we, if we do, we'll be in this radically futuristic scenario. Uh, Blanchot was like this when I was in graduate school. Derrida was saying, you know, Blanchot is so far ahead of us, we have not yet caught up with him. And I'm not saying Blanchot's not important, but where is Blanchot today? He's by no means guiding us 25 years later in philosophy. He's a kind of a special interest figure that some people work on, mostly in literary theory. So maybe the idea that Blanchot was futuristic was off somehow, or at least it hasn't happened yet. Merleau-Ponty is another, and I hate to say this because I came out of phenomenology in some sense, and my, uh, my first important teacher, Alfonso Lingus, is an expert on Merleau-Ponty, translated a lot of his stuff into, into English from French. But a lot of people act as if Merleau-Ponty is the visible and the invisible, is somehow the most futuristic text out there, and even analytic philosophers in philosophy of mind have picked up on Merleau-Ponty. But if you look at him, what's really going on there? He, people talk about the flesh in Merleau-Ponty. The world looks at us. We're not just looking at the world. So there's supposed to be this radical position where the world is looking back. And Lacan kind of does this, too, with the sardine can, which he takes from Merleau-Ponty, the idea that the world is gazing back at us. OK, but doesn't the world have better things to do than gaze back at us, right? There are parts of the world, and they, they do things to each other as well, right? If you're too focused on the world doing something back to us so that it's not merely a, a, a one-way dyad, but that it's going in both ways, you still haven't solved the problem. Right? You haven't solved uh, the fact that there are parts of the world. If you say the world looks back at us, you're treating the world as though it's still just 50% of ontology and humans are the other. And as much as I love Lacan, I, I have a number of questions to ask you about Lacan tonight if we get, them, get to them. Um, the real in Lacan is never adequate for me because what does it really do? It traumatizes humans. Right? It's, un it's an unsymbolizable remainder. As you've pointed out in reading Marx, it's a, it's a kind of traumatic kernel that we can't master symbolically. And recently I was thinking about this when Donald Trump more or less admitted he was too afraid to listen to the tape of Jamal Khashoggi being tortured to death. And I have to say that's the first time I've ever felt any human sympathy for Trump. I felt like I could be in his shoes and also not want to listen to the tape. I could kind of relate to his unwillingness to do this. And then Bolton made that fake excuse that he doesn't know Arabic anyway. So he wouldn't be able to understand the tape of this guy screaming if he, if he listened to it. So um, and, and parenthetically, I want to tell you what my question for you is about Lacan. Maybe you can think of the answer. I just finished reading Badiou's seminar on Lacan, which has been translated into English. I've actually been asked to review this book. And I love this book. And Slavoj has a nice endorsement on the back saying that he likes it too. I never read books which I endorse. Oh, that's right. OK. So you haven't read it yet? Oh. 
then my question is going to be useless. My question is, what is the main difference between you and Baudu on the question of Lacan? You can answer that, okay. I want to hear that. Because uh, here's another thing I want to say. The, the neo-moderns, as I've called them, don't simply go back to, to German idealism. Even, they all pay their respects to Heidegger. I hear this from Slavoj, I hear it from Baudu, I hear it from Measu. Yes, Heidegger was one of the greats. I think you called him the real deal. Baudu said he's the last universally recognizable philosopher. But then I find that, that Heidegger doesn't really play a strong role in these philosophies. He, the, the typical Heideggerian themes are not central for you and Baudu and Measu. You're aware of the importance of them, but you don't integrate them. And so, so someone might be tempted to say they're just harking back to Hegel. Right? They're trying to press the reset button on phenomenology and go back before to Hegel. However, they also add their own twists. Uh, what would Hegel be most puzzled by in Slavoj's work? It's the presence of Lacan. Uh, Hegel never had any encounter with, with psychoanalysis, and he could have learned a lot from it. It would be interesting to know what Hegel would have thought about psychoanalysis. And yes, there's a bit of that in Badiou as well, the Lacan. Uh, it's not as central as it is for Slavoj. You, you can hardly go a couple of pages in Slavoj without running into Lacan. Badiou, it's more, you know, he calls him our wily master. And then when Peter Hallward asks him in the interview, what's your real relation to Lacan, he really downplays it and says, I never went through analysis, I never met Le uh, Lacan. And yet in the seminar, you get the sense that he is central. He's the central anti-philosopher for Badiou. For Badiou and Meassou, it's really uh, Cantor, Transfinite Mathematics, who is the most important addition to the German idealist tradition. Hegel also couldn't have known about the different sizes of infinities. Uh, about 100 pages. Not all of you know that Badiou's third volume of Being an Event is out. It's been out in French since September. I just found out a couple weeks ago for some reason. And I'm about 100 pages in. And so far, there are no big surprises in uh, L'Immanence des Verités, The Eminence of Truths. It looks like the theory of large cardinals will do the mathematical work in this book that uh, set theory did in being an event and category theory in logics of worlds. Uh, if anything, it's even clearer than the first two volumes, but I don't see any intellectual surprises yet. But you could say Lacan and Cantor are the new influences, post hegelian influences that they add. But I also would ask about the status of Heidegger for these philosophies, because Heidegger is certainly not as central for any of these three as it is for me. And what is central for Heidegger? Well, it's included in the, uh, what's central in Heidegger for me? It's included in the title of this talk, Withdrawal. What's the exact title of this? With the withdrawal of objects, or the withdrawal of? Yeah, and Entzug is a word Heidegger uses a lot. Um, and they can see in Entzug. Okay, withdrawal. Withdrawal is usually the first term that comes to mind when someone asks, what is object-oriented ontology about? The thing withdraws from any attempt to capture it or grasp it. OK, that's true, but it's not broad enough. Withdrawal is only one of four uh, equally important concepts that all have in common the loose relationship between an object and its own qualities. This is the next part of what I want to talk about. And how are we doing on time? About good, good. seven or eight minutes more? Or? Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. I've already talked about undermining and overmining and how uh, philosophy can't get a knowledge of the things because the things are never reducible downward or upward. That kind of knowledge of the things can never exhaust the things. And so this is why for us aesthetics is important, why indirect discourse is important. And we didn't invent this idea. It's already out there in the tradition. So um, rhetoric, which was much more important to tradition in ancient times than it is today, of course. Rhetoric for Aristotle is all about that which is unstated. You say it without saying it, the enthymeme. So the classic example from Aristotle's rhetoric, this man has been three times crowned with laurel. You can say that in ancient Greece, and people know that means this man won the Olympics three times. You wouldn't spell it out. It would be rhetorically inferior to say this man has won the Olymp uh, is crowned with laurel three times, for he has won the Olympics three times. You don't need to say that. And not saying it is somehow more powerful rhetorically than saying it. And our human cognition is filled with these sorts of examples, of some of which I gave last night. Uh, one of them being that you don't always learn more about a thing from being more explicit about what you mean. This is the great vice, the great assumption of analytic philosophy, that by being more and more clear, you understand a thing better and better. That's not always true. That'd be like saying, you know, this, this, this painter, this Leonardo guy, what's this chiaroscuro garbage? Why doesn't he just paint everything in plain direct sunlight so that we can see it better? That'd be a ridiculous idea about the arts, obviously, right? You use shadow when you're painting the Mona Lisa because it it tells you something important. The same thing true, uh, is true about human cognition, that you, um, my favorite example that I also mentioned last night, Daniel Dennett on wine tasting. Daniel Dennett is one of the most reductive American philosophers alive today. Science always has the last word for him. 
And he has a passage in his article, Quining Quelia, where he makes fun of wine tasters. And he imagines a man um, tasting the wine and say, flamboyance and velvety pinot, but lacking in stamina. And he says, what a bunch of garbage. Real wine tasting is when you pour wine into a machine and it gives you the chemical formula. OK, you can learn something about wine from that. But you've also lost something when you, do, when you paraphrase the wine in terms of the chemical formula. There's more to it than that. There will always be a place for the flamboyant and velvety pinot lacking in stamina. And yes, that can become pretentious very easily. There are a lot of pretentious wine tasters. There are pretentious theater critics, pretentious architecture critics, pretentious philosophers. You're probably not going to find a pretentious chemist or physicist. That's not the uh, congenital vice of the sciences, pretension. You might find arrogance or narrow-mindedness, um, <coughs> lack of intellectual breadth, but you're not going to find pretension. This pretension is the professional risk we run in the humanities because we have to rely on indirect discourse in a way that the other, uh, the sciences do not. And we should own that. We should become comfortable with that. Um, we, threats, I've given the example of threats often, and the Godfather is the classic example. I'm gonna make him an offer he can't refuse. You don't want that to be more explicit. Threats are less effective the more explicit they are. If he had said I'm gonna cut the, guy's, the head off the guy's horse and put it in his bed at night when he's sleeping and blood's gonna get all over his blankets, it's grotesque, but it's not as threatening. A real life example comes from Dick Cheney. Um, this was in the run up to the first Gulf War. It's a horrible example, but it's a good example of a threat. There, there was talk, you may remember if you were alive then, that uh, Saddam Hussein was considering using chemical weapons against the American soldiers. And the message that, that Dick Cheney, who was Defense Minister of the US, Defense, Secretary of Defense, sent to Saddam Hussein was something like this. Um, if, if Iraq uses chemical weapons against American soldiers, the United States will respond promptly and decisively in a manner from which it will take Iraq centuries to recover. You know, a brutal statement, but very effective as a threat. Much more effective than if he had said, if you use chemical weapons, you will use nuclear weapons. Much more effective to hint at it rather than to say it. I mentioned jokes before, right? A joke only works when it's indirect. When you literalize a joke, you ruin it. When you say, um, um, somebody was telling me to come up with some new jokes, so I won't use the surrealist and the light bulb again. Uh, there was a survey a few, uh, 10 or 20 years ago that took a list of 200 jokes and asked people in each country to vote for their favorites. And you, so you could read this list of which is the favorite joke in each of the countries. And they were all bad, but some were worse than others. The least bad was Belgium. I appreciated their sense of humor the most. And they're all bad again, but the Belgian one, the, Bel the Belgian favorite was, uh, there are three kinds of people, those who can count and those who can't. Okay. Not that funny, but let's say you have a child here who says, Daddy, I don't get it. What, what does the joke mean? And you have to explain it. Well, he said there are three kinds of people, those who can count and those who can't, and he only gave two. Therefore, he must be one of the ones who cannot count. So he's included within the typology he has, he has set out of different types of people. And then maybe the kid gets it, and they don't feel left out anymore, but you've ruined the joke. Uh, metaphor is another classic example. You cannot paraphrase any metaphor. This has been known to literary critics at least since the 1940s, if not back to Russian formalism. You don't paraphrase a, uh, a metaphor. Wine dark sea does not mean that the wine and the sea are equal in the exact wavelength of light that they both uh, reflect. No, it means more than that. You're ascribing all these other vague properties of wine to the sea when you call the sea wine dark. You're ascribing oblivion and drunkenness and danger that comes with wine to the sea and so forth. And the new critics in literature uh, talked about how an entire poem is not paraphrasable in prose terms. Just like you cannot take a globe, which is three-dimensional, and flatten it on a map, which is two-dimensional, it's mathematically impossible. The same is true with figurative speech and literal speech. You cannot convert literal language into, I'm sorry, the figurative language into the literal kind. What is it that makes literal language? The definition of literal language I would give is that it rep simply replaces an object with its qualities, with a supposed list, a true list of its properties. Whereas in the case of metaphorical language or any kind of figurative language, that isn't quite what happens. There's an excess to the sea that is not understood by simply listing all the properties of wine. Um, here's another thing about metaphorical language. Literal language you can reverse. You can say a pen is like a pencil or a pencil is like a pen. It means the same thing. They both can be used for writing. But when you say wine dark sea and then you say sea dark wine, they don't mean the same thing, right? In the case of sea dark wine, you're taking the properties of the sea, like depth and adventure and unmappedness, and ascribing them to the wine. So you can't just reverse it, right? There's a um, asymmetry between the subject term and the predicate terms. 
And so this is why uh, figurative language is very important for us in Tripolo. Now I wanted to, to make a final statement about Tripolo, um, which is that we have two dualisms that are important to object-oriented ontology. And we end up with a fourfold. Well, a lot of people in the history of thought, Western and otherwise, have fourfold structures. You find fours in Chinese thought, and in Indian thought, and in ancient Greek thought, and more recent mysticism, and all kinds of different, there are four fundamental forces in nature, according to physics. There are, there's four poles of the semiotic square of Grimus, and so forth. Now, what, what is, why do these fours keep popping up? The fours keep popping up because if you have two dualisms and you cross them, you're going to end up with four different kinds of things. Now, you have to choose these wisely. You have to choose two dualisms that have a reason for existing. You can't just say, as I said in one of my books, that there are, everything in the world is either electrical and non-electrical, and it's either Italian or non-Italian. You'd end up with this absurd fourfold of electrical Italian things. So you'd have Olivetti computers and so forth. Then there's non-electrical, non-Italian things, which would be the vast majority of the cosmos, things that are non-electrical, non-Italian. So it's absurd. But what if you choose your two poles wisely? Well, if we come out of the Heideggerian tradition, as Triple O originally did, the most obvious dualism there is the, the dualism between the concealed and revealed, the withdrawn and the cleared, the, um, the veiled and the unveiled, all these terms that Heidegger uses that mean roughly the same thing. You've got that which can be directly present to consciousness and that which is not, that which is hidden. Okay, so that's one. That's Heidegger 101. That's, that's basic Heidegger. What's the other one? Well, it turns out you learn the other one from Husserlian phenomenology, and even Husserl scholars have missed this. What's really going on in Husserl? People get, get obsessed with, is Husserl an idealist or is he a realist because we're always already outside of ourselves intending objects in the world. They're missing what's really going on, that even if you interpret Husserl as an unrepentant idealist, which is how I interpret him, because everything is, everything is in principle visible to some observing consciousness, there's something going on there that has not happened before in the history of philosophy. And that is a critique of the idea that an object is just a bundle of qualities. So if you go back to David Hume, there isn't really an apple, right? Because you just have red and hard and cold and juicy and sweet. And we see all these attributes often enough together that we create this nickname apple that applies to all of them. There isn't really something called an apple over and above all those qualities. There's all those qualities that come in a bundle and through habits, customary conjunction, we decide that there's this thing called uh, an apple. And it's surprising how many philosophers have implicitly accepted this, right, this idea. For example, in, in Badiou's otherwise wonderful theory of objects in uh, Logics of Worlds, there's still this sense that an object presents itself according to a given situation. There's no difference between the object and its qualities. The object itself is a unit and its qualities. Now, what's most interesting about phenomenology to me is that it reverses that supposition. For phenomenology, the object always comes first. The, the qualities are somehow enslaved to the object for the simple reason that they can change and it's still the same object. So I take this bottle to do a basic piece of phenomenological analysis. I rotate the bottle in my hands at different angles, different distances, as my moods change, lighting conditions change. I still never think of this as anything but one and the same bottle. And so the bottle is one and the same object despite its qualities. So we have the interesting fact, which is fairly unique in the history of philosophy. Kant almost got there with his transcendental object equals x, but not quite. Uh, this idea that you have a tension between an object and its own qualities even within the, the realm of experience. And this is the second one, because you find this not only at the level of appearance, you find this at the level of reality in the history of philosophy. Leibniz being the best example. Leibniz says in the monadology that monads are one, but they also have a plurality of qualities, because otherwise all monads would be alike. So a monad is both one and many simultaneously. So what object-oriented ontology is really about is not just withdrawal, it's about the idea that there are these different relations between objects and their own qualities that are tense relations. Uh, you, as, as Saul Kripke showed in Analytic Philosophy of Language, when you name something, you're pointing at it, even if all the qualities you thought belong to it don't really belong to it. So if you ask the average person on the street in the United States who's Albert Einstein, most people will say he invented the atomic bomb, which is completely false. Right? He sent a letter to President Roosevelt urging him to start on it. That's about the only connection he had with it. He was too leftist for the US government to trust, so he was never invited onto the project and so on. Or if you ask who was Christopher Columbus, the average American on the street will say he discovered America which even if you forget about the Indians rather than the Native Americans, uh, it's not true because the, clearly the Vikings were in Eastern Canada, they found Scandinavian coins there, so it's simply false. So when you find out that's false, you don't say, oh, then I'm not gonna call him Christopher Columbus because I've defined Christopher Columbus as the one who discovered America. Therefore, I'm gonna start calling Indians Christopher Columbus, or I'm gonna start calling Leif Erikson Christopher Columbus. No, Christopher Columbus is this guy you're pointing at even if all the qualities you thought were there are false. So the way Kripke and Husserl go together there, 
Um, so you've got these tensions, and they turn out to be four tensions because there are two kinds of objects. There's the kind that Husserl talks about, which ex exists only as the correlate of some experiencing consciousness, and then there's the real kind of object, which you get if you take Heidegger's tool analysis and get rid of the holism where he says that all tools are together in one system. They're actually not because tools can only break if they already have some surplus that's not used by the system. A hammer can break because it's not equivalent to what it does for the construction worker. So you have that, you have objects for us or objects for any, any other entity that exists, and then you have objects buried in the depths. And the same with qualities, because Husserl, there's something else interesting about Husserl. There are two kinds of qualities. You've got these uh, blue and transparent gleaming shapes as I or, uh, circle this body, bottle in my hands. But you also have real qualities. You have qualities that the bottle needs in order to remain in this bottle. If I started seeing some of the fundamental properties of the bottle change, I will decide that I was hallucinating. It's not really the, this bottle. It's something else. It's a holographic projection designed to deceive me. I was wrong about the kind of object it was. So in Husserl already, you have these two kinds of qualities that are both in tension with the same object. The real ones, which he says can never be found by the senses. They can only be determined by the mind through categorical intuition. He's wrong about that. Our minds are no better than our sense organs at getting at the things themselves. But he at least makes this fascinating division between two kinds of qualities that exist. So we have two kinds of objects, two kinds of qualities in triple O. And the method of triple O in any field in which it's used, and we're, we're pretty successful interdisciplinarily so far, is you're trying to drive wedges between objects and their qualities in different ways. You're trying to find a way in which you're not eliminating the object that's something apart from its qualities. So in the case of uh, the arts, I've got this manuscript, Art and Objects, that's waiting for the second reviewer to provide feedback before I send it. Uh, the reality of the art object, as distinct from its visible qualities, uh, becomes what's key for the artwork. A certain je ne sais quoi that you cannot put your finger on in the case of an artwork. And that if an artwork's qualities are too obvious, it's not art. There's no aesthetic tension. Um, and then I tried to do this on the level of social theory with my book Immaterialism, which was about the Dutch East India Company. And I'll just say something very quickly. It's my favorite book. I had the most fun writing it. I knew nothing about the Dutch East India Company before I started researching for this book. And I picked that object because I like Leibniz. And Leibniz makes fun of the Dutch East India Company as an example of a pseudo object. Right? He's got this, this correspondence with Arnaud where uh, my least favorite aspect of, of Leibniz is that he ha takes this fairly commonsensical distinction between substances and aggregates. Substances are things that are one by nature, like a plant or an animal. And then you've got these aggregates, like machines, which are just different parts put together. They're not really a natural unity. And so we can't really talk about airplanes or any of these machines as being objects, whereas for me, you should be able to. And he gives some examples of aggregates that are pretty funny. He says, a man is a substance, but a circle of men holding hands is not. OK, that's good. Uh, he says, a diamond is an object, but two diamonds glued together is not an object. Because it's unnatural, which is funny, because even one diamond is pretty artificial. You have to polish it and cut it just the right way. And then finally, he says, uh, the Dutch East India Company is not really an object. And it seems to me the Dutch East India Company is obviously an object. It lasted a lot longer than many physical objects do. It lasted nearly 200 years. It was the world's first corporation, so it had tremendous echoes throughout history. Uh, it lived longer than all of the individual officers who served in it since it was almost 200 years. Um, it outlasted a number of political arrangements. I doubt any of the ships in the company lasted that long. And so I think it's clear that the Dutch East India Company is an object. Now, how do you analyze that object and its transformations? The social theory I love best is, of course, actor network theory because of my interest in Latour. And, and, but there are some problems with actor network theory, if you're familiar with it at all. In actor network theory, you're supposed to follow the, act, follow the actors, see what's doing the work. And a thing is nothing more than the sum total of its actions. And this is a very nice method for avoiding certain hypocrisies and presuppositions. So Latour will not agree that there's something called society that exists. That's too big a term. It's too macro a term. There's all these more moderate-sized and small-sized actors that do the work. He wouldn't agree with, with Slavoj that something like capital exists. He and Delanda, actually, would both prefer Fernand Brodel's analysis of capitalism to Marx's, because Brodel tries to show how capitalism emerged from regional and local markets. And, Capitalism finally emerges as an anti-market uh, anti monopoly. This is what capitalism really is for Baudel. They would prefer that sort of idea, rather than the idea of capital as this totalizing force that is oppressing us all that needs to be overthrown. Well, um, there's a problem, though, with actor network theory, which is that it, when, it look, when you look at things in terms of their actions, everything becomes important. So one action of mine is that I you know, push my hair back like this and a couple of hairs fall on the floor. 
Well, for, for actor network theory, that's an action that has certain consequences. But I think you can see that there might be a sense in which that doesn't matter at all to me. I'm going to endure robustly no matter what happens with individual hairs on my head. They're not really important. I change my shirts every day. It doesn't really matter. Uh, for most objects, including each of us individually, there may be five or six things that happen that are important. I'm, I'm sticking to that thesis. There are only five or six really important things that happen in your life. And interestingly, they are, they are usually coming from the outside. They're not coming from you sitting around and brooding about who you are and what your future should look like. It's a person, an institution, a profession, a new habit, a new city. Cairo, in my case, changed everything for me. I can't go back to who I was before Cairo for a number of reasons. So um, I wanted to find a social theory that limited the importance of certain actions to ones that really transformed you in some way. And the model I found that was the best was that of Lynn Margulis' uh, endosymbiosis theory in biology. If you don't know Lynn Margulis, you should read her work. She died unexpectedly a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Darwinian evolution was always somehow presupposing this idea of gradual change, that big fish, big fish eats little fish, and big fish three, has, little, has bigger babies, and therefore gradually over time, fish become bigger and more ferocious because of the struggle for survival. And as Stephen Jay Gould pointed out, this had a kind of um, negative political effect because it suggested that all change has to be gradual and that we shouldn't try to revolutionize anything. You know, Gould was a leftist of sorts, and, and he liked the idea that there could be sudden changes. And so Gould and, and Niles Eldridge came up with an alternative theory, punctuated equilibrium, in which evolution has long periods of stability, and then very suddenly there are these transformative things, like paradigm shifts in Kuhn's theory of, uh, of history of science. That there's a lot of, you go on for a long time and nothing important is happening, and then suddenly everything changes. French Revolution or German idealism. Suddenly everything is different than it was before. Lynn Margulis also has this idea of sudden change, but to me it's more interesting than Gould's and Eldridge's, because Gould and Eldridge end up thinking that a lot of these sudden changes are environmental, right? The asteroid hits the Earth, dinosaurs are dead, and so mammals have a niche they can emerge into. Margulis's theory allows for a more internal approach to change. Um, endosymbiosis. It's the idea that evolution happens primarily through the symbiosis of two previously independent creatures that come together and form one new creature. And her classic, uh, the classic example in her theory is that a lot of the parts on the inside of human cells originally didn't belong to our cells. They were parasites or they were viruses or something that came into our cells originally as parasites. And then over time, we use them for our own benefit. We probably use some of these parasites to be able to survive in the heavily oxygenated atmosphere. Oxygen's a very bad thing. We think of it as good because we've evolved to breathe it, but it's very volatile. Some people think that if the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere were just a little higher, the whole planet would burn, just like your Russian philosopher wanted, uh, that, that everything would catch on fire. We, we have a dangerously almost unstable amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, despite global warming. Oxygen is still a little higher than it should be. And it seems to be because living creatures are recycling it and processing it and keeping it somewhat stable. Now, Margulis was, was kind of a maverick even as a graduate student, and she was ridiculed for some of these theories. And she finally asked a very interesting question that someone should have asked before. Where have we seen evolution happen in the laboratory? This was the late 60s when she was asking this. And they said there's only one case, and it involves fruit flies, as usual. And what they did is they took a tank and put fruit flies in the tank divided the tank down the middle, and then they slowly raised the temperature on one side of the tank and slowly lower the temperature on the other. And so after a certain number of months, they find that the fruit flies can no longer mate with each other, so they meet the definition of new species. And so then they'd kill and dissect the poor fruit flies, as they always do, and they say, ah, the experiment's ruined. The hot fruit flies have a virus. There's a contamination. Experiment's ruined. Margulis said, no, that's precisely the point. The hot fruit flies formed a symbiosis with this virus and incorporated it into their physical structure, and that's why they're able to survive the heat. She also predicted, correctly it turns out, that if we're ever able to analyze the DNA of a cell, we're going to find that the DNA for a human cell does not code for all the parts we find there, which therefore proves that those parts are aliens. They came from outside, and that we've, we, we started by having these things as parasites off of us, and then they eventually um, became an important part of who we are. And so I was looking for symbioses in the case of the uh, Dutch East India Company, five or six things, and I, hypoth I hypothesized that these will tend to happen early on in the history of any object until it reaches stable, mature form. And then after that, it's a matter of rise and decline. Once you've reached your mature form, which is going to happen in the earlier part of your life, it's going to be a matter of this and then this. Um, and it's going to be generally five or six because that's, we only have a certain number of 
of notches so things can fit into us and change us. One minute? Okay. And I ended up in the case of the Dutch East India Company with, I think, one person who transformed the company, and that was this guy, Jan Peterson Kohn, who's a sort of uh, classic imperialist villain uh, from, from, for post-colonial historians, because he's the one who ensla ended up enslaving all these peoples and all these islands in what is now Indonesia. Uh, he cut down their trees so that the Dutch East India Company could control all of them. And yet the Dutch had to do this for a reason. The Dutch were in an existential struggle for survival with the Spanish at the time. They were a rebellious province from, from Spain. They, Spain had acquired the Netherlands through marriage. And so the Dutch rationally, it was already a liberal city and they felt bad about it. They were having to monopolize and take over all Asian trade and exclude all the other Europeans because we only, that's the only chance we had to survive as a nation. This is how they became very rich. Uh, and then also two places, which are two separate islands that turn out to be the only really important ones that define the geography of the company. And then there were, were two things. The only one which I can remember is that the Dutch East India Company made a strategic decision at one point to stop focusing on long round trips between Amsterdam and, and Jakarta, and instead to focus on intra-Asian trade, trade between Asian ports, which required that they change their ships from these giant Dutch ships to uh, smaller ships able to go up Asian rivers and dock in Asian ports. And so that affected the, the company as well, their choice of ship design. Anyway, you can read that book if you want to find out about that. And if you want to learn about Margulis, you can read Symbiotic Planet as a good introduction. Uh, to me, she's one of the more important thinkers in any field in the last half century. Maybe I'll stop there um, and go on to the next stage or whatever you yeah, yeah, imagined. Well, thanks for the Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I actually have two questions. Okay. I hope you will answer. Mm -hmm. The first one is, I read this uh, Lacan seminar on, I'm sorry, this Badiou seminar on Lacan. That, yeah. that slip is because sometimes I felt like I was reading a Lacan seminar. It has that kind of atmosphere <laughs> to it. This is from 1994, 95. Yeah. It was just published in English. And I'm starting to see more Lacan and Badiou after reading that. Mm. It's obvious in your case how much Lacan there is. Mm. It's not obvious in his case mm. always. What is the difference between your interpretation of Lacan and your friend Badiou's? Well, OK, and now, uh, my God, this is a question which uh, uh, which calls for a one-hour answer, you oh, know. I thought you said it was simple. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, okay, I can just enumerate some points. Okay. One is where I hope I have a little bit of your sympathy, mm -hmm. is that Badiou has this notion of subject as objectless, mm -hmm. basically, which is connected to his, we have ferocious, if you think you are my enemy, you should see me debating but you, okay. because uh, I accuse him and he explodes that he is a closet Kantian, that his duality of event and being is untenable philosophically okay. for me. And in a typically Kantian way, mm -hmm. he says that event somehow emerges out of the order of being but cannot be reduced to it, mm -hmm. but he gives no explanation and then uh, he at some point he even becomes almost mystical well he says there are some traces when the order of being gets inflected which my solution to simplify to the utmost is here very radical that but uh, and this is what I was aiming at when I talked today about that gap antagonism pre-transcendental that uh, Another symptom of Badiou, in spite of all his praising Kant, sorry, Lacan, did you notice this is? He had some kind of a absolutely aggressive reaction when you mentioned the term death drive. Hmm. This doesn't exist for him, doesn't exist in the sense that he often uses even this moralizing term, death drive is decadence, non-creative, whatever, whatever. I think that I reject his ontology which takes that the order of being, this kind of a neutral, flat order of being is always here, but through some miracle from time to time, here and there, events explode. Mm -hmm. To put it in very abstract terms, I think that even the order of being is secondary. This is the established order of things and so on and so on, that what Freud designates as the death drive comes first which means that also there is some type of subjectivity which is not yet but use subjectivity in the sense of fidelity to, to uh, truth event and so on and so on. But uh, can I counter with another? I have sure. no idea. Uh, with, with, uh, first, let me say something a little bit pathetic, but I mean it absolutely <laughs> sincerely. 
I use this metaphor only for my best friends, uh, uh, which is who are, in some sense, as you said, my enemies. No. You Americans are British, I don't know who. You have this wonderful, I even used for but you once this metaphor, wonderful term when you have a clumsy friend who does you more damage than good. You say with friends like this, yeah. who needs enemies? Yeah. For you, I would say the exact opposite. <laughs> Maybe you are my enemy, but with enemies like you who need friends. <laughs> because I find much more productive a very polemical dialogue with you that then any talk with these blind, dogmatic Lacanians who just answer you with some vague metaphors, and you can see it clearly that I agree totally with you what you were saying about meta metaphors, uh, indirect speech, but admit it that there is also a very bad form of bluffing in so-called continental philosophy. Sure. Well, complex metaphors means basically only that it's not clear even to you what you really want to say. <laughs> and at least I hope that we both at least try to be, in spite of all metaphors that we use, mm -hmm. in this not this abstract Cartesian clarity, but some kind of basic clarity. Exactly. It's not this empty poetry. You know, right. sometimes I explode that, for example, I will be open with some writing, not so much by Derrida himself, as for some of his pupils, you yes. know. Oh, yeah. He deals with the real problem, but did you notice, without even directly addressing the problem, you get first some 20 to 30 pages of this ballerina dancing. <laughs> am I writing this text or am I being written by this text <laughs> and so on? And then I say, okay, okay, <laughs> finally they get. So uh, to make this clear, uh, now I will try to limit myself to just two, three central points which I think are, which I think are important here. I'm somewhere between you and Latour. I, with this question of act potentiality, that if you reduce an entity to its relations or to what it does, you cannot explain change. Change mm. must come from the surplus. Yes, but what I want to say here, and I will give you exactly an example the way I see it, I may be wrong, from the domain of art. Look, let's, uh, uh, let's, isn't it uh, like, okay, let's take this table right. and read it in the way you briefly indicated in the Heideggerian way. Mm -hmm. Okay, it serves certain things that we know now, but it can also serve, let's say, there is a catastrophe, new cold era, we can use it to burn fire, <laughs> we get into conflict, who will stand closer to the fire, each of us. Tears right. off a leg, we start to fight, right. whatever. <laughs> but it's a little bit, I have a little bit of uneasiness to say, this is the withdrawn hidden side and we can use it in different ways. Isn't it nonetheless this? Yes, in abstract way, you can say this table has infinite properties. properties. In the, right. No properties, but uh, possibilities, <laughs> potential uses. But I would nonetheless claim that uh, to make these uses, even if they are not realized, but to make them, uh, in Aristotelian sense, an actual potentiality, an interaction with external space is necessary. And I will give you an example which you might find problematic, precisely from art. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with what you developed about how art cannot be paraphrased, reduced to, and so on and so on. And I will give an example which is very simple one I hope we will all agree, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you that Shakespeare is for me, and I'm saying this as some kind of a suspicious leftist Marxist. Any, I never trusted this historicist reductions to Shakespeare. Mm. You say, to uh, really understand Shakespeare, you have to know all about commerce in Elizabethan mm. England. I would say almost the opposite. Right. For us to understand Elizabethan England, read Shakespeare. Mm. 
I don't believe in this historicist reductionism. And the greatest proof for me is that really great works of art have this universal dimension, but not in a cheap sense of they speak to all of us, whatever, <laughs> but they, they can be rediscovered in a totally yeah. new way by every epoch. As we all know, correct me, I'm not good in history, if I am, but I think that immediately after his <coughs> death, it was the rise of French neoclassicism, Racine, and so on. And for about 100 years, a little bit more, wasn't Shakespeare considered a kind of a vulgar B-level yes, author? By Voltaire. Yeah. Sorry? By Voltaire, among others. Yeah, among yeah. others. It yeah. was only when, the late 18th century, that this Renaissance... And then, what's so miraculous for me about Shakespeare is how each epoch, then almost you get a romantic Shakespeare, you get a realist Shakespeare, you get many versions today. And what really, you should like this example, I hope so, fascinates me, is how some of the Shakespeare's detail, you can do this in a wrong way. I don't like any actualization. But I like, it's only because I want to boast, I mention it, and he's my friend, I know some stars. Rafe Fiennes did a version of Coriolanus mm -hmm. set in today's big city where the, uh, the, that tribe Volsians or whatever, which are attacking Rome, are almost today's Kosovo, Albania, mm -hmm. it's kind of a big uh, corrupt... Uh, 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 and it works wonderfully. So what I'm saying is this. Okay, you can say that potentially this is the withdrawn side that was all the time there. But in a way, to become real potentiality, you need a different historical constellation. So you know what I mean? I would like to introduce there a distinction. In an abstract sense, who knows what we can do with Shakespeare? It's I don't know what. You can imagine a new ultra-Stalinist dictatorship where they will use it and so on and so on. <laughs> but in a concrete way, all these ever new Shakespeare dimensions are the result of interactions which precisely bring out or at least create the space for, to bring out the new thing in Shakespeare. I will give you another example I don't like. Maybe we disagree here, he's too liberal for me, uh, Salman Rushdie. Hmm. But he made one excellent remark. I was a couple of years ago in uh, uh, Basque country uh, 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 at a debate with him where some politically correct idiot reproached him that he is too integrated in England, into England, that he should have be more faithful to his Indian, no, to England, yet Indian tradition and so on. And here I must admit, he, Salman Rushdie gave a perfect answer. He said, no, you are wrong. The key influence on me are two great Indian writers. And you can guess who they are, Jane Austen and Charles Dickens. <laughs> because he said that Dickens, this Oliver Twist, World of Poor Orphans, that's the Bombay of my youth. Jane Austen, all this you know, slightly impoverished middle classes arranging marriages, that's the situation, the predicament. So, you know, this is the true universality. So, you see what I'm saying? I would have said, nonetheless, to discover or to bring out all these potentialities, mm -hmm. some kind of, it's not simply an excess of the thing in itself, mm -hmm. it's hidden side against the interaction. It is that precisely if uh, Interaction brings out new things, and I will give you an example. I totally, I, I like this so much, what you said, but we shouldn't lose time because we simply agree here there would be no blood if we talk yeah. about this, <laughs> namely Margulis, what you said. Yes. And so another thing came to me. I also have, although basically I'm, I'm on the side of Stephen Jay Gould, there are things I don't agree, but I love his notion of acceptation, mm -hmm. where he says that the basis of progress is precisely that an organ element, which was evolutionary, if we can talk like this, meant, created, or emerged to fulfill some function, can be reappropriated, accepted for a totally different function. And you know how far does uh, Stephen Gould go here? He thinks that even language is this. <laughs> it's born out of acceptation of our throat. It's not some kind of a 
natural expression, and so on and so on. So this would have been my first. Let's drop all that big stuff. Maybe it's better that we keep to this uh, concrete, uh, concrete relatively example. So would you agree that it's a little bit more complex? I wouldn't oppose in the way you do simply uh, the relations in, in which this table, for example, is and its inner autonomous, whatever you call it, out relationship potentialities. In an abstract sense, again, this is true. But it's always a context which brings this out. To give you another example, and I advise you to see it, I love it. Even such a typical Russian author like Dostoevsky. I absolutely think, and you can download it, and all of you for free, uh, on Pirate Bay, whatever. <laughs> you get it? I think the absolutely best film version of Dostoevsky is Kurosawa's Idiot. Hmm. It's a totally different situation. It's set in Japan after the end of World War I, where the idiot, instead of coming from asylum, where comes from the front, and then basic, and it works so perfectly. Precisely. This is what interests me. Don't be sometimes the acceptation, the betrayal of an author, a reading of a work of art totally out of its context can precisely open up new potentialities of reading it. So I more believe, returning to what I developed this uh, morning, midday, whatever, uh, uh, I, 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 I more believe that the work of art it's not that it has in itself, yes, it has in an upper all the potentialities. It's simply, I would have said that it's in itself thin, open, incomplete. Yes. Simply, it's not that we, if we were to go deep into Shakespeare's mind, we would discover what more he meant. I basically don't even care what, what Shakespeare meant. Sometimes misunderstanding can tell you more. Second thing, more important philosophically, and then it will, I will maybe, hopefully, stop. Uh, yeah, if you talk, me, uh, if we speak about difference from but you, you know. Yes. It's so strange, but you now even attacks me as making too much compromises with right-wingers and not being truly a Marxist. But, you know, although but you wants to be the great Maoist communist, did you notice how he radically ignores what is for me the central part of Marx's critique of political economy. That practically doesn't exist for him. He speaks in these very abstract journalistic terms, oh, 1% of the people have 50% of wealth or whatever, but that's another story. Now comes the crucial point. Uh, I'm going into that, uh, how you replace, uh, how you locate subject-object as one of the relationships among objects. OK, uh, I, and then you mention Heidegger withdrawal. Incidentally, I tremendously enjoyed, and will even, to amuse you, tell another joke. Uh, uh, your, uh, this, I find this joke perfect, because it's literally true. This, I not, don't think it's so stupid, this Belgian joke. There are three oh. types of people, too. Because I think this would be the basic Lacanian undermining of the binary opposition of sexes. There are three sexes, masculine and feminine. Okay, I will not go <laughs> now into it. What? <laughs> but uh, the, what you said, you know which jokes I admire, where uh, it's not that at the end, in the final denouement, you learn something extremely complex and so on. My favorite jokes are the ones which begin in such a way, promising something deep, ultra, and then the final outcome is surprisingly poor. And it's wonderful because then you really enjoy the very process of being seduced. My favorite one, I mention it only once in my book, I hope you don't know it, uh, in my book, uh, uh, one of the best uh, Soviet Stalinist jokes. And I think the greatest cultural inheritance we have for communism are good political jokes. We cannot even raise to it today. It's a very simple one. Again, it's not a mega joke. But I like the final reversal to 
brutality, brutal simplicity. It's, they debate in mid-30s in Soviet Union, will there be money in communism or not? First, you have left-wingers who say, yes, of course, money is alienation, commodification, there will not be money. Then right-wingers, Bukharin, market socialists say, but money is natural to exchange object they will be. So Comrade Stalin comes, intervenes, and said, guys, there are two deviations here. Left-wing deviation, there will not be money, and right-wing deviation, there will be money. The money, the truth is the dialectical synthesis of the opposite. This was the big slogan of Stalin. That there will be money and there will not be money. And then they ask him, but Comrade Stalin, such an ingenious idea, but what does it mean? And you can guess what Stalin answers. Well, there will be money and will not because some people will have money and other people will not have money. You know, I, I love, you, here you can see clearly how the whole, serp, like if Stalin were just to say in, in, in communism there will also be injustice, poor and rich people, it would not be a joke, nothing. <laughs> so now I come, I didn't lose my thread and then I will stop. Uh, uh, when you mention Heidegger with the drawal, I would nonetheless insist, and here my youth when I was very young is also like yours, very Heideggerian. I began as a Heideggerian. My first book is on a reading of Heidegger's thought about language and so on. When Heidegger speaks about a withdrawal and Zug or whatever, mm. isn't for him this and Zug something absolutely immanent to what would be for Heidegger disclosure or what the opposite of and Zug? And Zug is something which is absolutely immanent to disclosure. It's even up to a point one can say the invisibility, I use wrong terms, I know, of the structural role of disclosure itself. While if we speak about relations among objects, withdrawal means that there really is something out there in objects more than what they appear to be more. So I think, again, Heidegger is here strictly immanent, and Zug is literally, radically, it's not that in the history of being there is a part which is there, hidden. Every comparison here with, and I'm not here on Heidegger's side, I just try to describe him, every comparison with realism, where you can say we never know perfectly the objects, uh, they have a hidden side and so on. This is not what Heidegger means, and I would be tempted to say that the examples that you listed, which again, I find, uh, I find uh, wonderful, uh, all the examples of poetry, double me, uh, this uh, 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 impossibility to paraphrase and so on, is not the hidden side. That what you cannot uh, uh, bring out directly by paraphrase. You mentioned the term which I like, this is another name of Lacan's object small a, je ne sais quoi. Mm -hmm. But isn't this nonetheless uh, th that yes, you relate to something hidden, but this is strictly prohibited, sorry, uh, strictly produced as an excess of saying itself. Of, you know, you talk about something and through this talking you produce an excess. To give you an, a most stupid example that you can imagine, because I... Yes, to, to, to answer your, your question. Um, I didn't dig it. You, the only, shut up, and the only what thing you can do <laughs> to make this debate more democratic is, don't you have a stronger light for a third degree, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I will finish soon. Uh, I'm sorry. My point would have been that uh, if you've seen the movie, uh, I hate it, Four Weddings at the Funeral, you know that famous love statement of... Hugh Grant to uh, Andy McDowell. Of course, he stumbles, he gets confused all the time, but through this he gets the message through. It's also impossibility to paraphrase because precisely you cannot say there is a message behind it. The, what is withdrawn is 
the strictly an immanent product of, of saying it. And I find a little bit difficult all these wonderful examples of you about uh, this indirect speech, poetry, jokes, mm -hmm. to translate them into relations between objects. Because there, I think, at least up to a point, we are doing with a uh, really invisible sight there. It's not simply that we talk about this table and through indirect speech we produce something else and so on. This is our metaphorics. It's not, in some sense, I don't see that this is immanent to the table. I stop. I spoke too long. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. But, but I hope I did the right thing because I didn't <laughs> want to talk too much, but like two concrete yeah. questions, basically. You even ran across the other question I was going to ask, which is what use you do make of Heidegger. And I've learned that, too, from your response. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah, yes. okay, okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. But maybe, As you would have said gently, you learned that I'm making a wrong use of Heidegger, no? No, no, that's not what I'm <laughs> going to say. I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, yeah. your point about how the things that are in Shakespeare are not necessarily lying there waiting to be discovered. Yeah. But I, I agree with that. That goes hand in hand with what I said about symbiosis. So that what you have when yeah. Kurosawa films, oh, it was Dostoevsky, when Kurosawa films The Idiot, what you have there is you have a compound created of, mm. of Dostoevsky and Kurosawa. So of no, course, here I totally agree with okay, you. Okay, we do. This symbiosis stuff. Yes, and, and I've read a lot of good criti uh, literary criticism like this. I think it was Harold Bloom who said somewhere that the three great American novelists of the early 20th century, and I think it was Faulkner, Hemingway, and Fitzgerald, all use Henry James in combination with some other influence in order to break free of Henry James' influence. One of them combines Conrad with James. One combines Mark Twain. And I forgot what the other one was. And, and so there are, to give you a theoretical example, you would agree, even Lacan, Lacan's return to Freud mm -hmm. means precisely that he takes an uh, intellectual, conceptual field totally foreign to Freud, structural linguistics yes. and so on. It's total symbiosis, what and, Lacan And mathematics. Does. And in, yeah. at, at the end of that seminar on Lacan, he brings in Jean-Claude Milner, who says that Lacan is Freud plus Coiré. Poirier's book on Galileo, mm -hmm. that that's actually what, that this mathemat mathematical aspect of Lacan is simply mm -hmm. not employed at all. So yes, and I'd say in your case, uh, the, what you, the things you're saying about Hegel are not lying there in Hegel waiting to be found. You have to go through Lacan to get them. Oh, yeah, good, Lacan, yeah. Hegel could have never come up with the stuff in his work that you come up with. In I, I totally so, accept yeah. this. Yeah. But, yeah. Can, but can I uh, a little bit focus on the question of the subject, nevertheless, again, because when you mentioned mm -hmm. language, I had the impression that you were underlining, nevertheless, the, the difference between a subject-object relation, for example, through language, as something that was really a difference compared to you, where you would say, well, also subject-object relations are truly object-object relations. So yeah. where do you find metaphors, jokes in object-object relations? I think, like Tim Morton, that causality is a certain type of metaphor, right? That things do not encounter each other literally any more than we encounter the world literally. That causation happens when somehow the things come into a relation that is not simply literally an encounter of their properties, but that they're somehow able to deal with each other as objects. Okay, just to quote my, let's stop here. So that I find a little bit problematic, and I don't privilege the subjects here, mm -hmm. to use here all these terms, indirect speech, and so on, and so on. And as for subject, now, precisely for you to enable to attack me, I would have said, yes, I totally agree with you. Subject is in some sense, one of the objects, and so on. And my reason for privileging the subject, it's not, oh my God, we are so important, is that in some sense, we are subjects, and we live in a certain symbolic universe. And uh, to adopt the position that you adopted, mm -hmm. it involves for me a certain position which is for me, my God, too arrogant, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, where are you talking? I, as if you are talking from some high position where you... We are caught in language. But I'm not claiming to be outside of that. Uh, see, I'm, here, I'm with Alfred North Whitehead here, who I think is the best metaphilosopher of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He Sorry, says... who? Alfred North Whitehead. I know Whitehead. Whitehead. Sorry, Whitehead. Yeah. Right. That, uh, uh, the rationalist way of going about this is to say there has to be some unshakable first truth from which everything else follows. So therefore, mm -hmm. whatever I say at the, at the first step of my philosophy has to be some kind of direct truth to me that I build everything mm -hmm. on top of. And mm -hmm. this is, Mayasu does this, for example. Mayasu says you start with the correlational circle as the first truth from which everything else follows. Whereas Whitehead makes the point that philosophies are not refuted, they're abandoned. Philosophies are not, do not fall because there was some knockdown argument that yes, showed yes, that they yes, didn't yes, have yes, some yes, yes. true, unshakable foundation. It's that they turn out to be too narrow or too shallow, 
to do justice. Who refutes Parmenides? There's, there's not really a refutation for Parmenides. It's just that you realize that the opposition between being and being is and non-being is not isn't going to do the job. You need, you need would more. Would you go further, Robert? It's such a lively, uh, not polemic, uh, just to understand the same Would you go even further? And I'm here very critical of Heidegger, of Hegel, of all, and to say that when one philosopher officially overcomes the other, right. it's uh, at least today's detailed reading can demonstrate it's always a misunderstanding, yes. basically. Yeah, sure. Aristotle misunderstood uh, Plato, right. Stoics misunderstood Aristotle, and the most sacred cow that I know, Kant misunderstood Leibniz and the rationalists be before him, Hegel misunderstood to a strong extent Kant, and so on. Zizek misunderstands Lacan. <laughs> uh, no, I accept this with <laughs> okay. all brutality, okay. yes. <laughs> Not to mention the last example. Harman totally misunderstands me, but OK. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you had this coming, and you knew oh, it. Yeah, and I yeah. misunderstand you. OK, we accept okay. this. Yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, uh, the question that you raised, isn't your position somehow uh, a position nevertheless from above to then make, make a dif distinction between subject-object ontology and object-object ontology? Isn't there some kind of truth uh, to this? Uh, to this uh, Very word deep, word? totally neutral insight. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. and, and also, from the, and also in the sense of when you refer to Kant, uh, I, I was I was wondering what Kant would say to your object or object oriented oriented ontology. He, he probably, of course, would reject it and probably say uh, that his uh, concept of the thing in itself uh, cannot give you the authority that you that you try to to do it and, and in that sense really talk about object-object uh, relations to, uh, in the way that we talk about subject-object relations. Would, would that come say, and in that sense it comes back to this super position that you're taking it as insightful, I think everything is what you're saying. What Kant would say to me, of course, is that I can't talk about object-object because the object-object relation is already mediated by the categories yeah, and yeah, yeah. space and time. But this assumes, as Descartes assumes, that we have more direct access to our relation to objects than we do to the relation of objects between each other, which we really don't. Psychoanalysis only exists because I don't really understand my relation to the other and to objects. Um, and yes, I know a lot more factually about my mental life than I do about his. I'm closer to it in that sense. I'm not really any closer to a direct access to my own internal life than I am to his, right? So. Object, object, all I can do is say, okay, I, I interpret, the, I, I encounter the world as Kant thinks, but there has to be a thing in itself behind it. I can, for the same reason, say that when two objects interact, they're not encountering the whole of each other either. I, I think I can make that statement with just as much right as Kant can make that statement about humans being finite. I can just simply deduce that the relation of objects is finite as well. So it's about all relations being haunted by the thing in itself, not the human world relation. Now, I was going to say something else. Ah, I was going to push back a little on your interpretation of quantum theory. You know, we're not experts, and we oh, don't please, want to yeah, make yeah, fools of ourselves. We to cut a long story. <laughs> At least I do. Okay, please, yeah. But you, you said something critical about Karen Barad somewhere, but I think you and Karen Barad have much the same interpretation, kind of a Copenhagen-esque interpretation of quantum theory. I, I have a slightly different interpretation. Oh, tell me, tell me, I, yeah. I, I, you and Barad both say, and I agree, that, that Bohr's position is more radical than Heisenberg's because yeah. Heisenberg. No, my is, enemy is Heisenberg. Right, that you can't measure. Even if he was from Munich, I think, no? Yeah, actually he was, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> and it, uh, you, you, it's not just that we can't measure the position and momentum simultaneously, it doesn't have them both. But I would point out that all this really shows is that possession, position and momentum are both relational properties. I don't see that you can read it as saying that there is no electron unless we're co-creating the electron. The electron is still there. It's simply that some properties are entangled. That means some properties are merely relational. It doesn't mean that the very existence of the, the electron is relational. And let me, let me bring up the commodity fetishism point. because mm. it's, it's, you, don't, you don't use this against me as much as some people do. Some people say object-oriented ontology is commodity fetishism. Oh, no, 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 no. Good, good. I wrote an article about this. Alexander Galloway was claiming I'm a commodity fetishist. The reason I'm not is because Marx's theory of commodity fetishism is a theory of value. It's not a theory of reality. Right? So a, sh a shirt doesn't have value independent of the whole means of social production. He's not saying a shirt doesn't exist outside of human access to it, right? Because there's several examples in the first few pages of Das Kapital where he says that the air and the water are not commodities, bartered goods are not commodities, the rent paid to feudal lords are not commodities. So commodities come fairly late. So I'm glad you're not using that against me. You, you talk about, uh, what's his name in, in Sublime Object a lot, um, the fellow traveler of the front. John Rettel, maybe. Yeah, the yeah exactly. Reading, yeah. Right. Right, and that's an interesting book, but some people have tried to use that to say that we're commodity fetishists, and oh. we're not. We're simply realists. All right, so, did I answer all his questions? No, but, you know, uh, another thing. Uh, 
you know what's my basic point, which I repeat in all my books, that I find, would you follow me here, and to yeah. what extent, of commodity fetishism? And incidentally, I'm where it needs to be critical, very critical of Marx and so on. I don't have any problems with that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, what works for me is, you know how mysterious it is already, I often quote it, the first paragraph of this famous subdivision, commodity and its fetishism, where Marx says, uh, commodity in a first approach appears a simple thing, but an analysis brings out all the theologic, uh, your Jesuit stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all that. Now, you know, Marx is saying here exactly the opposite of the vulgar Marxist idea that commodity fetishism is something obvious we are caught in it, but then science teaches us that it's just an illusion, that things are really different. No, commodity fetishism is an illusion which is not in our mind. We practice it when we are on the market. And we are in commodity fetishism even when we know the truth, Rashna. I like this idea. Maybe it can be combined with your stuff of uh, and uh, and This idea that illusions are not just cognitive illusions. Right. We can practice illusions. Right. It, they are implied by what we do. Even if we know that it's false. I mean, yeah. you cannot understand Trump without this. Exactly. Because, because Trump is cheating all the time. It's clear that he's lying. Talk too much, please. Go. Well, you have a wonderful example in one of your books of you were watching the documentary about some neo-Nazi skinhead, and the interviewer asks, yeah, 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 why yeah. are you a Nazi? And he says, I'm a Nazi because of the breakdown of paternal authority and diminishing social mobility. Yeah, yeah. And your, your point is that he's a Nazi nonetheless. Yeah, the, this yeah, conscious yeah, yeah. awareness. The ironic Nazi is no better than the, the naive Nazi. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's especially important today mm -hmm. when ideology itself tends to be more and more ironic in this sense. Umberto Eco, in your example, in, in The Sublime Object of Ideology, you, you call him a spaghetti structuralist. Because he's saying this you have, is so you have evil. To... I was so evil. Now I'm <laughs> no, no. But you know where I disagree with him. I wonder what? if you agree. Uh, uh, the mm -hmm. basic thesis of the name of the rose mm -hmm. that there is this uh, liberating, emancipatory power of laughter. Mm -hmm. No, I know. Believe me, from my own socialist, communist past, that. Uh, humor and laughter is a very ambiguous thing. Mm -hmm. You can also use it in a very brutal, authoritarian, totalitarian way. I remember, from <coughs> it, they were pretty intelligent, Yugoslav communists. From my youth, there was a dissident meeting. A woman was there reporting her experience in a communist uh, prison, how she was beaten and so on. And we knew that there are among the public some police regime provocateurs. Mm -hmm. But we were surprised what they did. They didn't do the usual thing, shouting at a woman, you know, you traitor, no, you are telling mm -hmm. lie. You know what they did? This extreme, like, <laughs> vulgar bitch, you didn't get properly fucked in prison or what. <laughs> this, through this total vulgarity, they almost succeeded undermining here. We were all so embarrassed. And this is, for me, again, a typical case of aggressive humor used as a tool of power, mm -hmm. especially in today's cynical times. Mm -hmm. But we are now Trump. escaping into politics. No, Maybe you should. The, the last thing that you, when, when you commented a little bit on your ideology theory, there I saw some kind uh, an obvious connection. Because I think in the sublime object of ideology, you say, we, can, we have to get rid of uh, some kind of fetishism of, of uh, the commodity when the commodity start stop talking among themselves. Uh, here we have my object <laughs> relation. Exactly, yeah, that, that because Marx kind of uses this term, which is a crucial fiction. He says, let's imagine commodities to talk to each other. Yes. I mean, in that sense, uh, you also have some kind of object-oriented ontology in your ideological theory, uh, the way, as you said, that ideology works in and practices without that there's a mind. Really yeah, but no, I will finish with a joke, yes, but you know, as an old Stalinist, I say, yeah, 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 democracy of object, but you okay. need police to control them so they don't <laughs> get too free. Okay, sorry. Right. But please, counterattack, say something. It's your day today. Don't allow uh, me yeah. to speak too much. I was just going to say that uh, one thing that worries me about the sublime object of ideology, yeah. classic though it is, 
is that you tend to associate ideology with realism. That is, as soon as someone is saying that something is real outside of the conditions by which we know it, it becomes an ideological danger. And the example I always remember Don't is that. Tell me, because, uh, please go. On. Your, your treatment of anti Semitism in that book is very, very powerful. You say somewhere in that book that the problem is not when people say that Jews conspire and steal. The problem is when they say they conspire and steal because they are Jews. Yeah, yeah. So they're positing a cause. But this is for, your je ne sais quoi. This is precisely that proper right. anti-Semitism never reduces, I will now give you your example. Okay. Proper anti-Semitism never reduces Jews to their properties. Right. They you know why? Because in this sense, I hope we agree here, I answered a reproach at the end, we had very bad relations of Ernesto Laclau, mm -hmm. who thought that in the case of anti-Semitism, there is a conflict, a potential tension between your ideological position, anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. and the daily experience. For example, you have her, whatever, Rosenzweig or whatever, a Jew is your neighbor, and you see, my God, he is a nice, kind man, he doesn't fit all the cliches, no, and that this would make you doubt your anti-Semitism. I claim if you are a true anti-Semite, no, if you are a true anti-Semite, you will say, you see how they mask their nature, they're even more dangerous for this, you know. So here, I think that uh, ideology, I make now a self-criticism. If I say this or imply I'm wrong, because I think that what you describe as this aesthetic structure, je ne sais quoi, and so on, is crucial for the functioning of ideology. Ideology is never just this humanist idea that, uh, uh, that you reduce it to objects. No, this object has to have a pseudo-spiritual dimension, whatever. And my worry is that you're using this as a, as a kind of argument against realism in a way that I don't, I don't think works. And I'm going to draw a parallel here between you Please. and Edward Said, who uh, did a lot of good things, obviously. And but also a lot of bad things. I agree with you here. And, and when I was at the American University in Cairo, he was the most sacred cow author. You couldn't really criticize him for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. But I think Said makes this, the following mistake in Orientalism. Mm. On the one hand, he says, um, uh, people, imperialism, Orientalism has to do with the fact that someone thinks they know what the essence of the Orientals is. Mm. And so you might say, these Orientals are incapable of democracy. They can't yeah, govern yeah, themselves. Yeah. They need a viceroy from the British Foreign Office. Yeah. OK, that's bad. But then he also verges on another kind of critique that I don't think is right, where he says, anyway, there is no such thing as an Egyptian. There's just a bunch of individual Egyptians. Now, the problem with this is it's too much like Margaret Thatcher saying society doesn't exist. Yeah, that I, there's just all these individual liberal uh, Egyptian consumers and voters who make their own decisions. I deeply agree with you here, and I will tell you why. OK. Because. Uh, now, this is almost, it will sound, don't worry, I'm still a radical leftist, almost mm -hmm. a right-wing counter-argument. Mm -hmm. But you notice how the same people who, whenever you say Oriental spirituality, oh, there is no such thing as Oriental, there are Southern Chinese, Northern Chinese, Indians, right. and so on. Right. But when they attacked Eurocentrism, things become simple. Right. We all know what it is, and so That's on, right. and so on. You know, okay. this is my big problem with it. And also, uh, also, where I don't agree also with some of these post-colonialists, not so much Said as especially later Homi Baba and so on, mm -hmm. is that they think that what colonialism wants is to integrate the other. They should all become like us. No, all good colonialism does exactly the opposite. I read in very good, you would like it, early, Aldous Huxley text, mm -hmm. Dressing Pilatus. His uh, travelogue in India, he said every proper British administrator, colonial, loved original, uh, original Indian spirituality. They like to say an ordinary Indian farmer has more spirituality than we. Right. But if an Indian wanted to learn Western science and so on, it was panic and, and mm -hmm. so on. So no, colonialism, was absolutely multicultural. I also got this lesson from South Africa. I remember in the last years of apartheid regime, okay, it was dirty ideology, but how they justified um, apartheid? 
multiculturally. They said, it's horrible. If we simply allow the blacks, we will lose so many different cultures and their wealth and so on and so on. So I think this is why, maybe I go too far here to the other extreme, but whenever some white people say, uh, this false respect of the other, you know, like this in United States, Native Americans, whatever you call them, first people, Indians, uh, they, they have a much deeper organic attitude towards nature. You know, like they, we just exploit nature and they what? They pray to some stupid god before they mine, in a, you know, like more, or, uh, I, I have some friends in Missoula, Montana, who explode when they hear this. They say that this is for them the most vicious racism under the pretext of this patronizing respect for you. No? Yes. They usually say, why don't we then exchange places? Give us your technology and you come to live a primitive <laughs> life like others. Sorry, I talked too much. Well, what I was, do I have time to have a response? Yeah, maybe a, a last response and then I would. Then we uh, pretend that we are in democracy or what? Right. No, uh, no, we don't pretend because. The I, I like this. I like. Yeah. Because you know what? Now I will tell you something <laughs> beautiful. We here are like leaders, communists. We speak for the people. Okay. We know better than the people what they want. So no need to allow them to. That's, that's right. right. No, I was going to say that I think. Leave him the concluding question. Yeah. I think you're on the side here of all the predictable critiques of essentialism. When in the sublime object of ideology, you say that the problem with anti-Semitism is that it essentializes the Jews, and it's positing a cause yeah, behind yeah. the effects. I disagree. I think what you and Said and Judith Butler are failing to see is that there's a distinction between an essentialism of reality and of knowledge. And here's what I mean. It's, yes, it's bad to say I know what the essence of the Egyptians is and I know how they need to yeah, be governed. Yeah. It's not bad to say that there is something about Egypt that's different from something yeah. about us. Obviously, when I moved to Egypt, I had to learn a lot of things about Egyptian culture. Some of them were nonsense, but some of them turned out to be true. And I had the reverse experience. I had a student in Cairo. This is wonderful. He spoke perfect English, but he'd never been to the United States, so his cultural knowledge was suspect. So they made him take an American culture class. And all of the stuff he learned in the American culture class was true. It's like when you telemarket to Americans, you can't ask them their salary, you can't ask them if they're married, which any Cairo cab driver will ask you, both of those questions, within minutes of entering the car. So it seems to me that the, the crusade against essentialism that you find uh, among most postmodern thinkers is misguided in the sense that it, it ends up becoming this anti-realist, anti-essentialist thing. And I think the mistake there is that it's always a mistake to link ontologies to political positions, because those change over time. And what I'm worried about is the way that, the, that feminism has grafted on too much to an anti-essentialist and anti-realist ontology, everything socially constructed. Because if you go back to the French Revolution, the opposite is happening, right? It's the revolutionaries who are appealing to essence and nature. We all have natural rights. And it's, the, it's the, um, the upper class in France that is talking about social construction. And it's taken so long to build up all this blood through royal intermarriages. And so we can't assume that essentialism is always going to be seen as an oppressive doctrine that we need to get away from. We need to consider it independently on its philosophical merits. I will not so, even uh, try to answer you because uh, I found uh, myself in a very strange situation because mm -hmm. I basically simply agree with okay. you. I don't consider it. Oh, wow. But yeah. no, 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 no. I am, I am, I am, as an old Hegelian, I am absolutely pro-essentialism. And right. I totally agree with you mm -hmm. that uh, one thing is this racist construction of the other, right. where you project your own unresolved antagonisms yeah. in them, and so on, and so on. But, but why should we, you know what I'm saying? Something much more refined in a Hegelian way. There are certain basic characteristics of certain nations. Mm -hmm. Even, and we can interpret this essentialism in a non-essentialist way, not in the sense of relativizing, but in the sense that this doesn't mean that statistically the majority have to, uh, have to fit it, but that even when they violate it, they relate negatively to it, like a, a very vulgar thing, but it indicates the direction where I want to go. When I was in Scotland, they were so kind to me paying everything and so on. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, frankly, they admitted that, you know, their trauma is Scots are supposed to be the ultra misers. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be very generous. But it's already mediated by this feature, which is there as the basic feature. And incidentally, we Slovenes claim that we are the true misers. We have a wonderful myth of Scotland. How did Scotland came to be? 
One of us was spending too much money. We put him onto a boat, and he ended up in Scotland. You know? <laughs> no, but you see what I mean. I totally agree with you. Just mm -hmm. essentialism shouldn't be a simple statistic, statistical category. Right. It is just the structuring principle. Yeah. Fine. Great, thanks. Well, thanks both. Thanks for the great talk. Thanks for the. And, and uh, please demand his book on immaterialism. It should really be. It's a stuff of. It should be not just. You know, some of these popular publishers, whatever, where you reach more people. I don't know, like Zurkam Taschenbücher Wissenschaft. The, yeah. It should, because it's so clearly written, it's so sad. Right. Was it translated These into French? Two books that I also no. would like to recommend. Uh, there are, as, as I already, well, already mentioned, Graham Harmon personally, that he writes, as also Sago just said, he writes very clearly. It's an easy and mm -hmm. very uh, inspiring mm -hmm. read. I really can uh, recommend both books. Which Have are they? a good night. Uh, show them to me, show them. Is it a speculative? Uh -huh. Ah. Object-oriented. Yes. Yeah. I like also this idea, new theory of everything. We shouldn't be afraid. That's right. No, but I agree with you. You can argue a stupid argument. <laughs>